Have you ever wondered what's inside a Destiny 2 speedrunner's vault? I get a lot of questions every time I pull up my dim from why do you have that role in your vault to how is your vault so empty? Today I hope to answer these questions through two videos. This first video will be a complete tour of my entire vault from exotic weapons to legendary armor and the second video will be a comprehensive guide on how to effectively clean your vault. Hopefully you also gain some insight into why endgame PvE players and specifically speedrunners keep certain weapons in their vault and why others don't make the cut. Let's start off with exotic weapons. Now, a disclaimer here, a lot of the exotic weapons in my vault are actually exclusively for a GM build series where I make an exotic build for every single exotic armor piece in the game. For example, Tommy's matchbook is on the Actium War Rig build for Solar Titan. So let's start from top left. And starting here, you might be wondering why my Wish Ender has so few kills. I generally prefer Arbalist in GM content with Barrier Champions. Wish Ender is good for solo content, which is why I've chosen to use it in some of my GM exotic builds, but it's probably going to be dismantled once that series is over. Malfeasance is for the Lucky Pants GM build, even though it's used in some low mans, I'm not really a solo or low man player, so I basically just use this, for example, when I'm farming Corrupted on an Eager Edge Sword in Malfeasance. We also have Ace of Spades, just a PvP weapon. Izanagi's Burden, speedrun and classic, don't really need to explain this one, it's just for range, precision, burst damage, very very good weapon. We have Arbalist for barrier champions in GMs, it's also good in certain raids like Garden of Salvation where you need to shoot through for example an Angelic's rotating shield. Arbalist has the anti-barrier property and can two-shot with kinetic surges, so that's why it's kind of useful outside of just barrier champions. We also have Lumina. Lumina is used in speedrunning in a variety of contexts, for example Lumina grappling to noble round projectiles, as well as buffing your teammates with an extremely ammo efficient 35% buff for both you and one of your teammates. We have Bastion. Now I think Bastion's a little bit underrated. Uh, Bastion, a lot of people are familiar with it because of year 4 PvP, where you could like one chunk someone that was in their super. Now since it's been nerfed, it is actually, Bastion has pretty competitive fusion rifle DPS and is very very ammo efficient and useful when you need to do impact damage to something like an object. So Crypt Security fuses come to mind, Prophecy, those blights in the wasteland, those, those come to mind, Bastion is really effective at dealing with those. We have Wither Horde. Now, Wither Horde, it might have a lot of kills on it. I have almost 100,000, but this kill tracker has been progressing very slowly ever since the pool nerf. I used to use this thing a lot in speedrunning. It was very prevalent for ad clear and ad trapping in speedrunning. But these days, a lot of people use either kinetic waveframes or they use forbearance. Wither Horde is not as popular anymore, especially after that pool duration nerf. Makes it a lot less viable than stuff like Anarchy in certain encounters. We have Dead Man's Tail, just the PvP weapon. Next up we have Agar Scepter. Now Agar Scepter used to be pretty popular because it was the only kinetic slot trace rifle, but now that we have legendary trace rifles in the kinetic slot as well, it's not as popular anymore. A big problem with old special weapons in year 4 and year 5 is that they were very ammo inefficient if you were shooting objectives like buttons. For example, a shotgun you'd have to waste like 1 20th or 1 15th of your ammo just to shoot something like a button. Agar Scepter kind of answered that problem and provided a good solution in encounters like uh, Root of Nightmare's first encounter, Root of Nightmare's second encounter, where you need to do some decent ad clear but also shoot enemies with a special weapon without switching to a primary so aggro scepter not as popular anymore but still useful in some cases where you need to do some decent ad clear with a hit scan weapon next up in the second row we have osteostriga this weapon has almost no kills and that's because i don't use this thing at all in endgame pve and speedrunning however it is in the necrotic grip strand warlock build so look forward to that when the gm build series drops next up we have quicksilver storm again this thing i don't use it at all it's just in some of the exotic builds uh, Vergless Curve, I would almost say it's only used in those exotic builds and it'll be dismantled after, but it actually does see some use in speedrunning. Now, sometimes in speedrunning, you want to create an object out of thin air that you can well skate off of or shatter skate off of. Vergless Curve gives you that opportunity without using something like Salvation Script, which consumes your sword ammo by switching to an exotic. Next up, we have Conditional Finality. Now, you might think, okay, Conditional Finality, he probably uses it in PvE, it's good for chunking down majors, you can use it for boss DPS, you can use it on champs. I actually don't use Conditional in PvE almost at all. This is almost exclusively a PvP weapon for me. I think it's a little bit overrated in PvE, um, but I do use it in PvE from time to time when I'm bored or when I'm using Sunbracers and I, you know, don't really have anything better to use. Navigator, I don't really think I need to explain this one. I mean, Strand Titan is very meta right now for solo dungeons, any sort of solo content where you can't afford to dump a bunch of rockets or you're on a sword instead. Navigator very strong on Strand Titan, don't really need to talk about that one. Um, but I will say in speedrunning, something that you might not be aware of, a lot of people are obviously very aware that this makes grapple points out of thin air on any class. Um, but something that we use it for in speedrunning is actually when some of our teammates are vulnerable, maybe they're carrying a relic or um, they're torn in King's Fall, we can shoot them with Navigator to give them woven mail and heal them so that they are a little bit more resilient, especially when there's less people in an encounter and they're kind of in a more dangerous situation. 
Next up, we have Necrochasm. Now, Necrochasm, I don't use this in PvE at all. It's just on my Chromatic Fire GM build, but I do use it in PvP from time to time. When I was getting its catalyst, I did uh, use it in PvP to get auto rifle kills, so that was pretty fun. I also have Wishkeeper, again, just on some of my Suspend GM builds, will be Dismantled After. Cold Heart, Fallen Sunstar build, same story. Uh, Merciless, now a lot of low manners really like this weapon, and it's really good for dumping energy special ammo without, you know, completely dumping it really, really quickly, like on Horseman without having a lot of total damage. Now, I don't really do low mans and solo content that often, so I barely use Merciless, but I'm keeping it in my back pocket just in case it might be useful on, like, the final stand of a boss on a day one or something like that. It's an excellent weapon for situations like that. We have Sunshot. Sunshot is maybe the only primary that I use in this game outside of Trinity Ghoul relatively frequently because it's kind of like Trinity Ghoul has very very good ad clear application and doesn't really require you to really hard commit into its gameplay loop. It's very very simple to use um, but it scales well into end game content which is something that Trinity Ghoul can't really say because uh, it's, a, it's a bow. Uh, and the lightning rod chains generally don't kill uh, more tankier red bars than something like a GM. Uh, Graviton Lance I pulled for some of the volatile void related builds for my GM series. Uh, Telesto, I actually pulled this for Iron Banner because I didn't have any good energy PvP fusion, so my friend was like, why don't you just try on Telesto while you're using Messenger? And I was like, okay, so I'm probably I'm probably going to dismantle it once this Iron Banner weekend is out. I also have Polaris Lance for the Celestial Nighthawk build. I was going to use Sunshot on the Celestial Nighthawk build, and then I realized Sunshot has intrinsic explosive payload, so a lot of those precision kills that you would normally get on another weapon that doesn't have explosive payload for Celestial Nighthawk are not going to count. So you would want to use something like Polaris Lance, which guarantees those uh, precision shots because it doesn't um, have an explosive component to its damage. Next up, we have Trinity Ghoul. Now, my Trinity Ghoul has 153,000 kills, and that's not for no reason. It's a speedrunner favorite because this weapon is probably the most lethal ad clear weapon for activities that are at base power. For example, Garden of Salvation, a 1600 raid. Goblins can be shredded with careless abandon if you use Trinity Ghoul. Forbearance, of course, is a favorite for ad clear, but it requires you to have a wave that travels across the ground. Not very good for enemies that are around corners or in circular groups. So Trinity Ghoul is really, really good, very easy to use, and speedrunners love this weapon for a very good reason. Next up, we have Wave Splitter, no kills. This is just for an Astrocyte Verse GM build that I'm planning. If it doesn't end up going well, I'll probably replace it with Graviton or another Void weapon, but for now, Wave Splitter is in that build. Teraba is on the Peacekeepers build. I just wanted an SMG that scaled off of hits rather than kills, and Teraba has very, very high primary DPS once it has Ravenous Beast active, so I thought it would be a good pick for the Peacekeepers build uh, on Titan for my GM build series. Next up, we have Ariana's Vow. Now, some of you may be surprised to see this in my vault, given that most people prefer Arbalist for Barrier Champ Stunning, but Ariana's Vow is actually not used for Barrier Champ Stunning in speedrunning. It's actually used because it has intrinsic anti-barrier for enemies like Cabal that are annoying and pesky and hide behind shields. It's also good for stacking up solar kills from a long distance away, kind of like a Xeno in special form, because it's a hand cannon, which feels good and has low zoom, in the body and damage profile of a sniper. Next up we have Divinity. Now Divinity is actually a weapon I barely ever use, and that's because after it's nerfed to 15%, speedrunners basically don't use this weapon at all. It's just used for two things. Number one, it's a trace rifle with almost 200 in the mag, so it's useful for stuff like wish wall speeds because you need to be able to dump a lot of trace rifle ammo without reloading, and it's also used in some GM speeds where you're on Cenotaph Warlock and there's overloads. Divinity has one of the fastest overload stuns in the game because it's hit scan, it's instant stun on trace rifle hit, so Divinity is used for some GM speeds in that context. Next up we have Tommy's Matchbook. I already talked about this. It's just for the Actium War Rig build on Empyrean Solar Titan, so not much to say there. Fourth Horseman is another speedrunning classic, fills a similar role to Izanagi's Burden, has a bit more damage in its burst, but because it is a shotgun range weapon, and because it also doesn't have as much total damage, it's a little bit more situational than Izanagi's Burden. In the fourth row, we have Cloud Strike. Now, Cloud Strike is actually used in speedrunning, not for DPS, just to make that clear. It is used in speedrunning when you need to kill a group of adds from a very long distance away, but you need to stay on a sword. So a good example of this is if you watch the current Root of Nightmares world record, they start the Explicator encounter by shooting the Scions using Cloud Strike from a very long distance away. And because this encounter requires you to kill all those enemies as quickly as possible to start spawning in the next wave of enemies and progress the encounter, Cloud Strike is a good option for that. Besides that, I just use it in PvP when I need to use a sniper, but you know, it's mostly just for PvE in those rare instances where I want to kill a group of enemies from a distance away while still using a sword. Next up, we have Edge of Action. Now you might be wondering, what is the Dome of Doom? What is the Titan Class Glaive doing in a speedrunner's vault? Well, to answer that, uh, when I was making the exotic weapon tier list a couple months ago, I came across this weapon and I realized that we're kind of in an era of flexibility when it comes to exotic weapons, especially if you're doing damage on Titan. 
So what that means is that you can actually make the edge of action little protective bubble. You can switch off of the weapon, the bubble will stay, and now the rest of your teammates, especially in activities like raids, will have this 5% stackable damage buff. It stacks with Well, it stacks with Radiant, it stacks with Lumina, all of the universal damage buffs that people use, Edge of Action is compatible with all of them. So it's basically free damage. Now, is it a lot of more free damage? Not really, it's only 5%, but it's there, and it's helpful, and so we've started implementing it into a lot of speedruns, and that's why I have it in my vault. Next up we have Trespasser. Trespasser was just the natural decision to make for a GM exotic build using Mechaneer's Trick Sleeves. That's all I really have to say about that. Hierarchy of Needs is up next. This is just for the Phoenix Protocol GM build. A lot of people were recommending it to me, so I thought I'd try it out. As an exotic primary that does rapid fire explosive damage, it does generate a lot of super energy, so it kind of makes sense to use with Phoenix Protocol. Vex Caliber is on the Triton Vice build on Hunter. Exterius you might think is a weapon that's just part of the Moth Keepers Raps GM build, but it actually takes part in speedrunning as well. If you weren't aware, weapons like Mountaintop and Exterius can be shot at the ground while you're jumping in order to propel yourself a bit higher, and Exterius is able to do this twice instead of just two-shotting you like Mountaintop would before it kills you on its third shot. On top of that, Exterius has a special property. Because you can bring it up to 1810 and it's not a sunset weapon, if you bring your power down to just above 1600, Exterius is actually capable of one-shotting you while you're over light. Now that doesn't sound very useful in most contexts, but in speedrunning, it can be useful to be able to one-shot yourself against the wall while still being able to do damage to enemies and not die instantly the second any ad shoots you. Finally, Exterius also has the special property of giving Amplify to you when you get a kill with its catalyst. This is useful when you're on, for example, Solar Warlock and you have Heat Rises. Getting a kill gives you Amplified, which allows you to get to much higher heights in a speedrun while you're using this weapon. The Wardcliff Coil is a bit of a weird weapon to find in my vault as well, and the reason for that is because if you've been following my damage spreadsheet or my damage series, you'd know that the Wardcliff Coil is pretty bad for boss damage. However, certain rocket launchers in this game are coded to do much more damage to red bars than they are to orange and yellow bars. For whatever reason, certain bosses in Destiny 2 are coded to take minor combatant scaling damage, which means that even though they're boss tier enemies, they take the same damage that a red bar would. So the Wardcliff Coil is particularly effective on these enemies, for example Dull Inkaru from the Shattered Throne and Hash Ladoon from the Scarlet Keep. Next up, we have Tractor Cannon. Now, Tractor Cannon, I don't really think I need to explain this one, but it's used in almost everything in speedrunning these days. Anytime you need to do boss damage, Tractor Cannon is the general debuff of choice that people tend to use. On top of that, it can also be used to boop enemies around. For example, in last switch speedruns, if you've watched the Vault Encounter, people go under base power, and they use Tractor Cannon to push captains out of the room so that they can kill them without having to traverse through the tunnels. Finally, Tractor Cannon also has a niche use in being able to boost your burden movement speed. So what does this mean? If you Tractor Cannon an enemy, while you have the scientific method on the left side of your screen, if you pick up something like a Relic or a Wrench which burdens your movement and forces you to walk, Tractor Cannon will maximize your movement speed while you're in this burden state. Next up, we have Sleeper Simulant. Now, you might be wondering why is Sleeper in your vault? Haven't you said that Sleeper is really bad for damage? And yes, Sleeper is really bad for damage. But the reason I have it in my vault, and the reason it has zero kills, is because I use it as a measuring stick. Every time a new raid or dungeon boss comes out, I head into that encounter with my friends, I pull out Corolla's Destiny Damage Tracker, and I measure the health that the boss has using two weapons, Sleeper Simulant and Xenophage. Now, some bosses have different precision multipliers from other bosses, and that's why I use Sleeper. Sleeper is a precision weapon, which has high damage per shot, and Xeno is an explosive weapon, which does body damage no matter where you shoot the boss, and it does high damage per shot as well, which makes them ideal candidates for measuring the health bar of different bosses. Anarchy is up next. Now I mentioned Anarchy being a little bit more viable than Wither Horde in some speedrunning encounters, and that's because Anarchy's traps last for 10 seconds, whereas Wither Horde's pools last for under 5. And so Anarchy is used in a lot of speedrunning encounters, especially encounters where you have a single or maybe two people in an encounter, and they need to trap a bunch of doors at the same time, Anarchy is the only weapon in the game that's able to trap six doors simultaneously with its arc traps. Now Anarchy, a lot of you have been asking me if it's good for boss DPS. No, the reserve buff did not make it good for boss DPS. We are in an era where legendary heavy weapons have taken over the scene like rockets and heavy GLs, so Anarchy and Double Slug or Anarchy and Double Sniper have long since left the damage meta, and that doesn't really look like it'll change anytime soon. Xenophage, like I mentioned, is good for measuring boss health bars, but it's also good in speedrunning generally and that's why I have 8,000 kills on it. Xenophage is useful when you need to kill a mini boss or a major or even some red bars from a long distance away and you don't mind not having sniper ammo. For example, Xenophage is used extensively in the second encounter of Garden of Salvation speedruns because with Radiant it can two-tap Angelics. It's also very good at dealing with clusters of enemies that spawn from doors in that raid. 
Salvation's Grip. Now, this weapon is not used for DPS, it's not used for ad clear, it's not even part of a GM build, so don't get it twisted. This weapon is used for a single thing, and it's called Default Spawn Manipulation. It's a speedrun tech where you can block off certain spawn areas using the big stasis crystals that Salvation's Grip makes, and when you die, you get respawned in a different spawn area. So that's why Salvation's Grip is in my vault. Eyes of Tomorrow. Now this weapon, it's actually pretty decent after its buff to refund ammo when you get 4 kills with 1 volley, but it's not very good in speedrunning because those rockets take absolutely forever to track and find their targets, and in speedrunning, lethality and quickness is the name of the game. So the Eyes of Tomorrow, it's just in my vault for the Reign of Fire GM build that I'm planning, after that it'll be dismantled. Lament. Now, Lament used to be used in speedrunning a lot before Eager Edge because its revved swing was a little bit faster than just doing normal sword skating. These days, Lament is not really used for much of anything at all in speedrunning. There's better solo damage options for strike runners. Even if you're doing DPS to Crota, people use Surrounded Bequest. So why is it in my vault? Well, Lament is basically just in my vault whenever I'm doing an LFG Crota and I'm too lazy or they're doing DPS from an area where I'm not going to get surrounded. I just use Lament because it's a pretty consistent damage option. Galahorn. Galahorn, speedrunning classic. I mean, even if you don't speedrun, this weapon is absolutely fantastic. I have over 100,000 kills on mine. It's great for ad clear. Its reserve buff makes it even decent for solo content. It's good for buffing your teammates whenever you're doing rocket DPS. It's good for GMs. It's good for like every facet of the game. So Galahorn is excellent. No surprise that it's in a speedrunner's vault. Now we're down to our last two weapons, Parasite and Dragon's Breath. Now these two are very easy to explain. Parasite has the highest burst DPS in the game out of any damage source, so it's very useful on bosses with short phases like Atrax. It's also useful for nuking down mini bosses and majors in stuff like dungeons as well. Parasite also has a hidden quirk called Worm Byproduct, where if you damage yourself with it, it buffs your other two weapons by 15%, and this stacks with every other buff in the game. So this is useful for some solo Parasite, you know, speedrun damage rotations and stuff like dungeons. If you look at the current solo Pit of Heresy world record, it's used there. But outside of those two contexts, it's not used that much in speedrunning. And finally, we have Dragon's Breath. Now, Dragon's Breath is the best solo damage exotic in the game, in my opinion. It's not really used in speedrunning, but it's excellent if you're doing something like a solo dungeon, and you don't want to do anything specialized, you just want to throw on an exotic heavy. And with its reserve buff to 12, it has insanely high total damage, and you can even use it for ad clear in between phases as well. Next up, we have Legendary Weapons. Now, I've taken the liberty of removing all of the exotic weapons from my vault, so we can take a look at all one and a half pages of Legendary Weapons that I have in my vault together. Now, let's start top left with Mountaintop. Now, the Mountaintop is, you might notice, the only sunset weapon in my vault. And part of the reason is I started playing after sunsetting was introduced to the game, but Mountaintop is also the only useful sunset weapon in endgame PvE. And the reason for this is that because it's 1600, it allows you to lower your power easily using an underlight class item below 1600 so that you can one-shot yourself, and it's also useful for Mountaintop jumping using something like Heat Rises. Next up, we have Heritage. Now, Heritage Reconstruction Recombination. I don't think I need to explain much about this weapon. It's very good for bursting down majors, and although Double Slug has kind of left its time in the sun, Heritage is still useful in roam content to one-shot a mini boss or champ in any activity. Next up, we have two successions. Now, you might be wondering, you have a reconstruction succession, but why no Vorpal or Firing Line? Well, first of all, anytime I've needed to use succession for a damage context, I found Supremacy has largely subsumed that role these days. Now, in terms of recombination, the reason why I have this is because there's a lot of speedrunning encounters where you want to have a weapon that functions like Izzy. It does high burst damage, and in one shot, it can take out something like a major. And in those encounters, a lot of the time, Izzy chews through ammo really quickly. You only get maybe six times four shots. And so Succession can kind of take over this role as long as you don't need to kill these majors very quickly and you can get some elemental kills in between. So a good example of this is, for example, the Duality Vault Encounter or Val's First Encounter Acquisition, where you're killing a lot of different Stalkers and Adherents, and then you need to kill an Orange Bar Knight every once in a while between those waves. Now my second Succession has Demo and Osmosis. Now you might be wondering, why do you have Demo and Osmosis on a Sniper? Well, the reason for that is when you're doing Verity's Brow DPS and you're on a weapon like Galley or Tractor so you can't afford to use Ariana's Vow, Succession with Demo and Osmosis can be very useful. Number one, it gives you enhanced demo levels of grenade return every time you kill an ad. Number two, your Succession gets reloaded every time you throw a grenade with the Succession out, so the small mag size of an aggressive sniper doesn't really matter. And number three, Osmosis allows you to transform Succession into a solar sniper when you throw a grenade with the weapon out. Next up, we have my Ignition Code. Now, this was my first main blinding jail. Of course, it has Slide Shot. Now, this is very valuable and very difficult to re-obtain right now, and that's why I'm holding on to it, even though I haven't used this thing in close to over a year, because I tend to prefer a blinding jail that's going to come up next, Pardon Our Dust. But first, before we talk about that, let's go to Wristwalker. 
Wrist Walker, this is the best in slot choice for lightweight pellet swapping, and although pellet swapping is kind of out of the meta these days, even if you're on Tractor or Galley, I still do use this weapon to chunk out majors like Knights in the King's Fall Totems encounter when I'm doing speedruns. Next up we have the Pardon Our Dust that I just mentioned. Now this thing has enhanced auto-loading holster which is a really big boon to me. It feels really good to have a weapon that loads very quickly after you stow it, especially something like a Blinding GL. Now demo isn't so useful because uh, you don't really get kills with a Blinding GL and you don't really throw your grenade to reload a Blinding GL most of the time, so it's mostly just for this enhanced auto-loading holster. Next up we have Wastelander, now this is just my kinetic 1-2 punch shotgun of choice because it has enhanced 1-2 punch, enhanced lead from gold is really good in GMs if you're generating heavy ammo and you're using a melee build, and of course it is a lightweight weapon so you have high handling as well as increased movement speed. Riptide with auto loading and chill clip, I don't really think I need to explain this one, it has overload stun in any season regardless of the artifact mods, and now while some people have said that this weapon has fallen off because you can't stun and unstop in two shots anymore, real ones know that in optimal play, you were only using this thing to stun overloads to begin with, stunning and unstop by freezing it and allowing it to shatter was slow to begin with. Defiance of Yasmin is my kinetic PvP sniper of choice. I don't really use snipers in PvP, but if I ever do need one in the kinetic slot, I do have this weapon to rely on. I also have this Imperial Decree with auto loading and trench barrel. Now this weapon I think is really underrated, I think a lot of people should try to use this weapon more. Imperial Decree is kinetic, it's a shotgun, it's an aggressive frame, and it has access to enhanced trench barrel and enhanced surrounded, two of the highest shotgun damage perks in the game, and with all of these factors combined, take this thing into a dungeon, take this thing into a raid, you can one shot mini bosses with absolute ease with this weapon, and so I cannot sing its praises enough, it's absolutely fantastic, I think more people should be aware of this weapon for roam content. We have Malicious Birthright next, now I have another Kinetic Blinding Jail besides Ignition Code and Pardon Art Dust, and it is the Malicious Birthright. This is my preferred role for GM specifically because it has Auto Loading Holster, and even though it's not enhanced, it does have Lead from Gold as well, which is really really a great perk for a Blinding Jail to have when you're generating heavy through stuff like Cenotaph Mask and Aeons. Next up I have this Allied Demand. Now you might be wondering why you have an auto loading under over Allied Demand in your vault. And the reason for that is because under over of course 50% damage bonus to barrier champion shields. So this thing shreds through even GM barrier champions with anti-barrier sidearm or with radiant. But the main reason why I have this is because it's just a holdover until we get the strand rocket sidearm when the final shape drops. Uh, Bungie has already talked about how they're introducing a solar and strand rocket sidearm in the future. So when those drop those will be replacing this and I will be dismantling this with haste. Next up we have Irukanji. Now this weapon has some of the highest total damage of any sniper in the game. 4 times a charm, great ammo regen perk, firing line, pretty decent damage perk, and of course we have the rapid fire frame which has the highest total damage of any sniper archetype in the game. The only problem is that this weapon is stasis, so a lot of the time I'll opt for supremacy instead, but this role is pretty valuable so I've decided to keep it, at least until a better option comes out. Next up we have the messenger. This is just a PvP weapon, not much to say here. Next up we have Pressurized Precision, I got this from Iron Banner recently, I've been told this is a pretty good PvP role, so I'm keeping that for now as well because I don't have any other kinetic fusions for PvP. We have Until It's Return, now this is another weapon that I cannot sing its praises enough. Uh, this weapon is just like Imperial Decree, it's really really good for roam content. Now if you don't favor total damage as much, this does do higher burst damage than Imperial Decree, so it's really useful, it's kind of like a pseudo fourth horseman in the kinetic slot, so I cannot recommend this enough if you're doing roam content and you need to kill mini bosses quickly. Coming up next we have my three supremacy rolls, now all three of these rolls look kind of the same under the hood besides the perk so I'll just zoom in on one so you can take a look. And so this first one has rewind rounds and kinetic tremors, this one has lead from gold and kinetic tremors, and this one has rewind rounds and bait and switch. And so the reason I have three, the first one is for proccing cascade point in damage rotations, a very very good swap TPS weapon for a legendary weapon. We have lead from gold and kinetic tremors, this one is for GMs, so when you're more ammo starved and you don't mind reloading between engagements. And then of course we have rewind rounds and bait and switch, this is one of the best legendary DPS weapons in the game, absolutely excellent for anyone that needs a ranged weapon, and of course on like kinetic tremors, if you have bait and switch with multiple people on supremacy, it still stacks perfectly fine. Next up we have Swordbreaker, now I mentioned this when I was talking about Wastelander, but it does have enhanced demo so it's useful for getting your grapple back if you ever lose it, and Curse Thrall allows you to create explosions that allow you to clear adds and stack up your banner of war pretty quickly, so it's a great strand titan shotgun. Warden's Law, I don't think anyone is surprised by this one, the best legendary hand cannon for Lucky Pants DPS. If you don't have Wither Horde sticking with Malfeasance or the enemy is not taken, Warden's Law is the optimal hand cannon of choice for hunter damage rotations involving Lucky Pants. Unending Tempest, this is just a PvP roll, nothing much to say here. 
Coming up next, we have Scatter Signal. Now, if you ever need a Kinetic Slot DPS Fusion Rifle, this is the best one that is available. Whether you're a Tractor user or a Gallarhorn user, this is excellent if you can't use something like a Bait and Switch Supremacy instead. Next up we have Appetence. Now Appetence, this specific role is not part of some special stasis build or anything like that. The only reason I have this weapon is because it is a kinetic slot legendary trace rifle, which means I can use it with weapons like the 4th Horseman and still use Cenotaph Masks to help my teammates get heavy ammo. Next up we have the Prophet. This is just a PvP weapon. I picked this up recently. Pretty nice, pretty cool. Next up we have 3 Tusk of the Boars. Now I got these recently from Iron Banner like 2 days ago. And so I have Slideways Chain Reaction, I have Slice Deconstruct, I have Slice Chain Reaction, all pretty good rolls. I'll probably narrow these down to like two rolls once I'm done with them, but for now these are the rolls that I've decided to keep. Next up we have Truth Teller. Truth Teller, I use this thing in PvP, has proximity nades, auto loading, disruption break, I use it with uh, you know DMT swapping or A swapping, I really like using this weapon. Next up we have Salvager Salvo. Now I actually don't use this weapon much anymore because Demo Vorpal, if you're doing a grenade rotation, I have a Demo Frenzy Wilderflight which does more damage and Demo Chain Reaction obviously has largely been surpassed by Forbearance at this point. So this is kind of a weapon that may be the only weapon in my vault that I'm holding on to kind of for the memories. I haven't used this recently as much especially since I've gotten this uh, Demo Frenzy Wilderflight and so I'm just keeping this for now. Um, it's still useful in some cases where you can't afford to aim at the ground with forbearance and enemies are spawning in a circular pattern rather than a linear pattern, but um, I'm kind of coping and this is kind of like the only weapon in my vault that I'm keeping for that reason. Igneous Hammer, just a PvP weapon, not much to say here. We have Cartesian Coordinate, it's kind of like the equivalent of Scatter Signal in the energy slot, Lead from Gold, Vorpal, great for GMs, decent for boss TPS if you're super chunking, just a good weapon overall, and uh, thankfully Banshee has sold like a 5 out of 5 of this weapon like 3 times in a row this year, so uh, hopefully you guys all have one of these as well. Found Verdict, if I ever need an aggressive frame shotgun in the energy slot for PvP, I've used this shotgun for a long time ever since I started farming Master Vogue, I've held onto this guy for a very long time. Next up we have Empty Vessel. Uh, ever since the spike grenades changed impacted special grenade launchers, Empty Vessel is almost equal to Wilderflight with surges, and so if you're surge matching, Empty Vessel is pretty decent. It's also a lightweight frame, so I tend to prefer using it because of its high handling stat, compared to something like an auto vorpal spike Wilderflight, which of course has lower handling. Next up we have two retrace. Now unfortunately, this is the only retrace with shoot to loot that I was able to keep before it became craftable and they removed shoot to loot from the perk pool. I actually had a shoot to loot frenzy and a shoot to loot demo roll that I would have preferred over this weapon. And imagine a shoot to loot demo retrace for something like Verity's Brow would be absolutely excellent. However, unfortunately, this is the only one that I kept. Now it has a lot of kills because I've been using this thing for a long time. I used to farm Master Vogue uh, with this weapon on Starfire and I kind of had a tricorn roll for that. But um, this is the only one that I have left. But thankfully, I, at least I have one, right? A lot of a lot of my friends don't have shoot to loot retrace and they kind of regret it because there's no shoot to loot solar uh, trace rifles in the game right now. I also have an adaptive munitions demolitionist retrace. Now you might be wondering, why do you have an adaptive munitions demolitionist retrace? This is my Verity's Brow retrace path because it has enhanced demo. You can, it's solar, you can throw grenades um, and you can reload it. You can also shoot enemies, kill them with Verity's Brow and get some grenade energy back using demo. But adaptive munitions, there's not really anything in the first column that's good on a retrace path now. So adaptive munitions is just decent for you know barrier champions if you ever get anti-barrier trace or you're radiant it uh, shreds through barrier champions very quickly so um that's why i have adaptive munitions father sins now this is a really weird weapon the only reason i have this crafted right now is because we don't really have any good void 140 rpm snipers and i need a void 140 rpm sniper to proc cast k point for the upcoming edge transit and the reason for that is because surge matching at 22 percent is a higher damage increase than something like firing line on tumulus or something like vorpal on twilight oath so it's actually better to surge match and not run any damage perk at all than it is to use something like twilight oath or tumulus with edge transit Next up, we have Explosive Personality. Now, this thing has a whole host of perks that are useful on it, from auto-loading to field prep to unrelenting to stats for all to one for all to frenzy to disruption break to blah, blah, blah. This thing has tons of perks. I think I've recrafted this thing like maybe seven or eight times with enhanced perks, and um, it's never left me disappointed. Great weapon for keeping up Empyrean, decent weapon for ad clear, even though it's not as good as Forbearance, but it has a lot of nice perks, and of course, it has land tank, which increases your survivability and harder content as well. Now, we come to my three Forbearances. Now, you might be wondering, why do you have three Forbearances? And you know, I have an ambitious chain reaction forbearance. I think everyone's aware of that one, but I also have unrelenting chain and I also have Genesis Wellspring. Now, the reason I have unrelenting chain is because sometimes in activities like GMs, ambitious assassin prevents you from procking soul drinker because you have two in the mag. And so sometimes I want a finer control 
over when I get Soul Drinker and I want to proc it more often. And so Unrelenting obviously also gives you health regen when you get rapid kills. And so this is like an ultimate survivability version of Forbearance that's better in stuff like GMs, where you don't really have this priority of shredding through enemies as quickly as possible by using Ambitious and shooting two shots back to back. I also have Genesis and Wellspring on one of my forbearances. Now, this is certainly an interesting role, and the reason why I have this role is actually for Garden of Salvation speedrunning. So if you weren't aware, the way Genesis works is that when you break a shield, it doesn't have to be a matching shield. Any shield that you break with your weapon hit, it reloads the weapon for free. And so forbearance, if you break enemy shields, those enlightened shields in Garden of Salvation, second, third, and fourth encounter, you get a free reload on your forbearance for doing nothing, just breaking those shields and, and hitting those enemies. And so in encounters where you may need to shoot forbearance over and over, maybe more than two times in a row, three or four times in a row, Genesis is really useful because you can just keep shooting over and over as long as you break a shield every time you shoot your wave. I also have Wellspring on this roll, and the reason I have Wellspring is mostly just to avoid having chain reaction. And that's because in Garden of Salvation in fourth encounter, counter when I'm killing enemies inside of the portals, chain reaction tends to send the moats flying off the map, and so if I'm going to have a waveframe that I exclusively have for Gardener of Salvation, I wanted to keep one that didn't have chain reaction so I don't send the moats flying off the map. In addition to this, in Garden of Salvation, if you have minor spec on your waveframe, during all the encounters where the ad clear is very sensitive, your waveframe will one-shot the ads anyway, so chain reaction isn't particularly useful. Hollow Denial, now a lot of people like this weapon with Lead from Gold and Repulsive Race. Uh, for me at least, I only use this thing because it has Enhanced Lead from Gold and it's in the energy slot for now. Uh, if I ever do make a maybe Jer Falcons build with Repulsive Race on it, I might consider using this weapon, but for now we have Graviton Lance in that build, so this weapon is just sitting in my vault as a Lead from Gold kind of of slot in whenever I need to swap to a weapon and pick up heavy bricks so I get uh, energy special ammo as well. We have Beloved. Beloved, it kind of serves the same role as my Defines of Yasmin. It's just my PvP energy slot sniper of choice when I'm not using Cloud Strike. Next up, we have Zowley's Bane. Now, Zowley's Bane, you might notice, has no enhanced perks on it, and that's because I barely use this weapon. I've actually crafted this weapon explicitly for GM builds that use exotic heavies, so I need a primary that can do some decent ad clear on the side if I'm in a more ammo restricted fire team. Midas Reckoning is up next. Now, this weapon is not for PvP. I actually made this just for the Golgoroth encounter in King's Fall speedruns. And the reason for that is because the bubble in Golgoroth takes no explosive damage and prioritizes weapons that have high impact damage. And so a high impact frame fusion has very high impact on each bolt. It has a pretty tight spread of those five bolts and it has excellent range. And so because of that, with this specific perk combo, you can two shot the bubble from a very long distance away, which is very useful if you're tanking and holding gaze like I am in King's Fall speedruns. Path of Least Resistance, I don't think I need to explain this one. This is like everyone's favorite shoot to loot trace rifle at this point if you don't have a retrace and Volt Shot is pretty nice for stunning overloads in a pinch in certain content as well. Coming up next, we have three Wilder Flights. Now, the first Wilder Flight, Auto Vorpal Spike for swap DPS with stuff like Apex Predator, with Rockets, with GLs, whatever you may have. We have Auto Loading Lead from Gold with Disorienting, which is really, really good for GMs. Basically a similar role to Malicious Birthright. We have Demolitionist and Frenzy. Like I mentioned, this is a salvo stand-in. If you're ever doing grenade DPS, you're doing a Verities rotation, you're doing a Pulse grenade rotation, Demo Frenzy Spike is really good for that. And with that, we're done with our first page of weapons, so let's move on to our second page. We have two Ikelos SGs, and I've sung the praises of rapid fire frame shotguns in the past, and it's for similar reasons here. First, we have Grave Surrounded on this Ikelos SG. I really like using this weapon with Sunbracers. I use this on Sunbracers all the time with Izzy because Sunbracers is so good at ad clear. The only downside of Sunbracers is not being able to chunk out high health majors. And so Ikelos SG is absolutely excellent for doing that if you're on something like an Eager Edge Sword. I love using this thing in Gambit, in Strikes, in general gameplay. Just a really nice weapon to have. We have, of course, Grave Robber once you punch Ikelos SG. I think every Strand Titan is familiar with this role at this point. It has enhanced one-two punch so you can miss a few pellets. It has a high total shot count, which means you can get more one-two punch procs out before you run out of ammo, which is absolutely essential for doing grapple melee damage on Strand Titan in something like a GM where you're a little bit more ammo starved. Next up, we have possibly the only legendary primary in my vault that isn't for PvP and isn't made explicitly for my GM exotic builds, and that is Ikelos SMG V3 with Seraph Rounds, Shoot Salute, and Frenzy. Now, this thing is mainly used for three special purposes. Number one, if I'm switching off a weapon like Trinity Ghoul or I've completely run out of energy special ammo, but I still need to shoot to loot some bricks, Ikelos SMG is useful for that, for something like a boss final stand. Second, Seraph Rounds allows me to shoot the buff off my head when I'm Operator in DSC in something like an LFG. 
And number three, Aikolos SMG is also useful for using ricochet rounds, the ricochet portion of Seraph rounds, to ricochet off the wall and die very quickly if you're under light without using anything like special ammo in case you have no mountaintop. Next up we have Prodigal Return. Now this weapon functions similarly to my Truth Teller, it's a disruption break swap GL for PvP for use with weapons like Dead Man's Tail. However, because it has spike grenades and not proximity grenades, I wanted to try out this weapon to see if I like it more because you're able to one-shot people with direct impacts at the cost of not having proximity grenades. Next up we have Word of Crota. This weapon fills a similar role to Zali's Bane, I just made it for certain void builds that have exotic heavy weapons and needed a primary that's decent at ad clear. Luna Regolith 3. Now this is a bit of a special weapon that has two purposes in speedrunning. First, it's a great Verity's Brow sniper as an aggressive frame sniper with snapshot moving target, very high handling and also very high damage per shot. On top of that, Luna Regolith is useful for an exclusive purpose this season and that is for proccing Flint Striker in a single shot. For those of you that don't know, Flint Striker is an artifact mod that gives you Radiant when you get rapid solar weapon precision hits or solar weapon final blows. And because it uses a mag size calculation to determine how many solar weapon precision hits you need to get Radiant, Lunar Regolith is an aggressive frame sniper which has a base mag size of 3 without extended mag or backup mag, which means that it can actually give you Radiant in a single headshot, which is useful in some cases. Next up we have Indebted Kindness, the game's first rocket sidearm. Uh, this role is not particularly good, I'm looking for Enlightened Volt Shot or Lead from Gold Volt Shot when I have the time. I haven't really farmed this thing yet though, so when I do have the time I'll probably replace it, but pretty useful in speedrunning, just a very high quality of life weapon. It's basically an energy slot forerunner, very ammo efficient, and uh, very good at killing individual enemies at almost no cost. Next up we have Undercurrent. Undercurrent, this thing has Demo, Lead, and Volt Shot, three very good perks in GM and high level scaling content. That being said, I tend to use Forbearance over this thing, and Forbearance is also going to get Enhanced Demo in the near future, so I might shard it once we reach that point in time, and Volt Shot is a little bit overrated for ad clear compared to Chain Reaction. Retro Futurist is the energy slot equivalent of Wristwalker for pellet shotgun swapping. It's void so it matches the tractor surge so it's great for tractor triple swapping. Unfortunately I don't really use this thing on Oryx anymore because Double Sniper has just proven to be better thanks to Supremacy's bait and switch being an excellent damage perk, but for now I'm keeping it because it's a pretty decent roll with Assault Mag and a lot of handling along with Quick Draw and Frenzy. Twilight Oath is my solar swap DPS sniper of choice and that's because I don't have a firing line tumulus and because Focus Fury requires you to stay on the weapon for at least 3 shots on Ikelos SR and generally speaking when you're doing sniper swap DPS you're only shooting 2 shots at a time so Twilight Oath is a little bit more preferred in that context. Next up we have the Summoner. The Summoner, this is just a PvP roll, so not much to say here. Commemoration, I don't think I need to explain this one. This is the best general ad clear LMG in the game. Next up we have Bequest. I don't really use this thing for anything besides sword DPS on two bosses, Riven and LFGs where they're not using rockets, and Crota whenever we're doing optimal DPS with Surrounded. Coming up next we have Corrective Measure. If you're using a grenade build, I think this is still one of the best, if not the best, machine guns in the game. Demo and Firefly are an absolute killer combo on this weapon, and despite its age, I think it still competes with the best modern options like Song of Your Youth. Next up we have my two Dare Swords. I get a lot of questions on stream asking me why I have a blue sword and a purple sword. The blue sword is for activities where I'm not killing any enemies with the sword, so it's just for high ammo count, it has 69 ammo. And the purple sword is for when I need to actually kill enemies, like for example in second encounter garden, when you're roaming around the map killing the barrier champions, it's helpful to have a damage perk, and it's also helpful to have a blade that does more damage and has higher impact. Up next is Typhon GL5. Now this weapon is used in one counter and one encounter alone in speedrunning, and that is the vault encounter in Last Wish. The reason for this is because in Vault, all of the enemies spawn in these circular patterns, and so heavy GLs are the preferred way of clearing these ads by just shooting a shot in the middle of these spawns as they appear. Now Typhon GL5 thankfully has an adaptive frame, it's capable of getting 6 in the mag, it has high explosive ordnance, mine has a blast radius masterwork and a blast radius increasing launch option to give it a blast radius of 80, which basically guarantees that you get the kill on all of the taken enemies inside of those spawns. It also has demo and wellspring, which means I can get my grenade back very quickly and use it to proc taken armaments more often, so I can then get more heavy ammo. A bit of a specialist pick is Caraxus's Distress. This is really good on certain encounters, for example Heffen, where you're surrounded, you have time to proc Envious off of many many adds. If you have enhanced surrounded on a weapon it's a 47% damage buff and on a weapon like a rapid fire heavy GL especially with the reserve buff this is a DPS monster provided you can get surrounded going. Now that being said when edge transit comes out it'll probably be higher DPS than Caraxes so I probably won't use this weapon anymore. At least for now it's useful for certain dungeon encounters where you're doing surrounded DPS. 
Cold Comfort is my burst rocket DPS weapon of choice. This thing has Envious and Bait and Switch. Uh, I couldn't be asked to farm for an impact casing roll, so I just settled for Envious and Bait and Switch. Currently, it is used in Zero Knight War Priest, for example, because in that encounter, you have a lot of time to stack up your Envious and get Restoration Ritual going. And Zero Knight War Priest is one of the tightest one phases in the game. And so a weapon like Cold Comfort is more valuable than Apex Predator. Next up, we have my five Apex Predators. So why do I have five Apex Predators? Well, I actually have each of them for an individual purpose. Reconstruction and Bipod is for GMs. We have Reconstruction Bait and Switch for general DPS. Next up, we have Reconstruction and Explosive Light geared out for max blast radius. And the reason I have this is because in the Shirochi encounter in Last Wish, ad clear is very sensitive and the ads are very spread apart. And so if you don't have high enough blast radius, there's a chance that you leave certain enemies alive and you slow down the encounter. We also have Reconstruction Surrounded for another specific encounter in Last Wish Speedrunning, this time it's Riven. The reason for this is the Riven DPS strategy currently is using Enhanced Surrounded Apex Predator alongside Star Eater boosted Blade Barrages in order to chunk out Riven in just a couple of seconds. Finally, the fifth Apex Predator in my vault has Danger Zone and Bipod. Now this role is also for a single specific use in Last Wish speedruns, and that is after you chunk out all of Riven's health bar and you're about to be teleported to the Ascendant Plane, you can use the Lingering Danger Zone from before you get teleported to boost yourself with Heat Rises all the way up to the Taken Strength in the sky to pick it up as quickly as possible. This next weapon is a bit of a sad story. Right before Cataphract is about to become irrelevant thanks to Edge Transit, I got a 5 out of 5 to drop from Trials last week with Quick Launch, Spike, Handling, Envious, and Bait and Switch, and so I guess I'll use this in case I ever do a dungeon or something in the meantime until I get an Edge Transit, but uh, yeah, that's what the Cataphract is for. We also have another Cataphract with Impulse and Chain Reaction. Another sad story, I mean, uh, Heavy GLs were recently got a stealth nerf in PvP because of the health changes to Guardians. You can no longer really one-shot Guardians unless you have Spike Grenades and you hit them directly, and so I don't really use this thing in PvP anymore, but I did, I did used to like using Heavy GLs in PvP uh, back when they used to one-shot people with ease. In case I ever need an arc machine gun, I have this Demo Sword Logic Song of Iryut. It has Cursed Thrall, so it's excellent with melee builds. Machine guns are one of the best users of Cursed Thrall, so this is a pretty nice weapon to have. I also have a Semiotician. Ever since the high impact frame reserve buffs, this thing has enhanced field prep and bipod. Absolutely excellent GM rocket if you ever need a Strand Surge matching rocket to use with something like Cenotaph Mask and Galley. I also have three Crux Terminations. This is a great aggressive frame with a variety of solid rolls. We have Reconstruction Bipod for GMs. Slideshot Bipod is also good for GMs. And finally, I have Slideshot and Surrounded. This is technically the highest sustained DPS weapon in the game with Slideshot and Surrounded active, but because of the limitations of slide shot in team environments and because of the rarity of surrounded being a perk that is active during a damage phase it's actually not used that much in speedrunning if at all next up we have the slammer now the slammer is probably going to take over the role of both my blue and purple sword in the future once both of these perks become enhanceable but for now it is actually used in some speedruns because the heavy attack skate is noticeably faster than other eager edge swords like half truce and the other half but the left click skate being slow because of the lack of enhanced eager edge is pretty noticeable so a lot of people opt to use adaptive frame swords like the dare swords for now finally we move to our last weapon and that is hullabaloo now a lot of people have been asking me if if this weapon is viable for day one because compressed waveframes actually don't do horrible DPS compared to adaptive or rapid fire heavy GLs. Now that being said, I haven't really kept a damage roll because edge transit is clearly the better choice when it comes to boss DPS, but instead I've kept an ad clear roll, one with auto, volt, and chain, which were the three perks that I was looking for on this weapon. Now before we get started digging through my vault in game, I thought I might show you some dim filters that you might find interesting. Now if we take a look at the number of weapons in my vault, I have 130. And if we take a look at the amount of armor in my vault, it actually dwarfs the amount of weapons in my vault at 291 over two times the amount of weapons that I have in my vault. Now, this might come as a surprise to some of you, but this is actually not unusual for a lot of speedrunners and generally end game PVE players to have. And that's for a number of reasons, and we'll get into those as I dig into my vault in game. Now the main reason why I have so much more armor than I do weapons in my vault is because there are 123 unique pieces of exotic armor in this game, all of which are randomly rolled, while the vast majority of exotic weapons can be pulled from collections at any time and have the same static roll. And as a result, I've decided to keep at least one of every single exotic armor piece in the game, and every time I'm farming GMs, or I get a random exotic engram to drop and I open it, if it happens to be a good looking roll, I compare it to the one that's in my vault, and I replace it if it has better stats. 
Now, another thing you might notice as we travel through my vault is that some of the exotic armor pieces actually have duplicates, and that's for a good reason. For example, Starfire Protocol, I have one role that has really high resilience and really high discipline, and I have another role that has more of a mobility spike. And the reason for this is because mobility obviously isn't needed if you're doing something like a GM, so you want to prioritize more resilience and recovery, whereas if you're doing something like a speedrun and you're using Starfire to actually have two fusion grenades for heat rises, then mobility makes a lot more sense. In addition to this, the vast majority of my legend armor is actually raid armor. I have kept a single piece of every single raid armor set for every single class just in case I need raid mods for that specific class if I'm speedrunning that raid. A lot of raids have very essential mods including Vow of the Disciple, Garden of Salvation, and Last Wish that basically necessitate the use of armor from that raid in order to play optimally. As for my other legendary armor, I have a few core sets that are focused around specific spikes. For example, on my Warlock, I have Resilience and Discipline spikes, I have Recovery Discipline spikes, and I have Mobility Discipline spiked armor that I basically use and reuse for every single exotic build or every single activity that I do that's not a raid. And finally, the last thing that I wanted to point out in my vault is of course the presence of Underlight class items and Underlight armor. So for example, I have these masks from Festival of the Lost. These are useful because if you need two armor pieces to really make sure that you're under base power if you have high artifact power, a Masquerader's Hood can be put on at zero power to really reduce you down below that 1600 mark. On top of that, a lot of people like to combine Mountaintop with an Underlight class item like a Dreamer's Bond. That's really helpful and that allows you to get below 1600, which allows you to die very quickly, which is very useful in a speedrun. If you have something like Mountaintop, you hit a load zone, you want to die as quickly as possible without having to use any heavy ammo. And that's all folks, I hope you guys learned a thing or two about what people that play endgame content keep in their vault. Over the next couple days, I'll be working on the vault cleaning video and that's something that I feel like I'm really good at, so hopefully you guys will get some mileage out of that as well. As usual, if you have any comments or questions about anything that I've had in my vault or anything that I talked about in this video, feel free to leave them in the comment section. And until the vault cleaning video, I will see you guys later.